Welcome to the Archive Guys podcast. I'm Matt Patterson, and these are my co-hosts. That Kelsey one is, Milburn. and the other one is, D.W. Ferranti. We have, now, Greg, your last name, I, maybe I screwed it up. Matt always pronounces last names wrong, and with your last name, I actually wanted to have you say it first. Oh, you're the air. It's air bar. Air bar. Greg, uh, if you're listening to this, because most of the people who encounter our podcast, it's audio. Greg's last name is E H R B A R. And your Twitter handle is at Greg, what I just spelled. He is a very active animation historian. And and more, because you worked, and more. And you worked more. in the industry for a long time time greg you, you i went to your website and uh you have two versions of your resume one which is <laughs> <I do>. like <laughs> simple yeah you do and then it's like if you want to read the details go down and it's like all like oh six yeah point type um well i actually started in film production mm -hmm. whoops uh you know and and uh and i was and i was writing uh, there as well as doing various parts because that was right out of college. Well, Greg, you just finished writing a book about Hanna Barbera. Yes, who? And yes, I did. We uh, together, you know, with all podcasts and uh, Comic Con, went uh, deep. We got to meet a lot of the people involved um, throughout the history of it. But there's number one always so much more. And number two, as time has gone by, um, people may now, you know, younger people may have heard Hanna-Barbera, but they may not know exactly yeah. who they were and what their importance is and how uh, they changed animation history. They're, they kind of have fallen into the among all the others. They're just this group of other companies, group of other clusters of characters. And what is not realized is they were at one time the biggest and they were the pioneers. And there is not anything on television that's animated uh, that doesn't owe what they developed. And it is all traceable back to what they did through trial and error and out of necessity. This book is going to be because I know music and records and voices and sounds. This is going to be told through the over 200 recordings that were generated by Hanna-Barbera and their artists, starting with the very first record recording that ever was generated by their work, which was The King That Couldn't Dance that came out of Anchors Away in 1945 and going all the way to the Tom and Jerry movie that came out last year mm. that Christopher Lennox did the score for, which you can get on, uh, you can download, which is a great score. And the stories he told me were like so incredible mm. and how he worked to get, the, to, to get the, the sound of Scott Bradley, but they couldn't actually use the, sco the actual scoring, but how they worked to get the sound of it and how... Yeah, you know, there, a lot goes into those things. They're not just slapped together because it's, oh, it's just Tom and Jerry. It's just, you know, it's not the big time. They really, they really wanted to make it good. And he was so thrilled to do this. And I'm whoa, not going to tell whoa. you everything. Tom and Jerry, I'm just going to say, corporate-wise, corporate are huge. the big time. Are the big time. Uh, well, uh, yeah, uh, and, and uh, Dee Doo. Uh, I, I know the fans, they, Pretty much, you are only focused on original Tom and Jerry, but uh, as not to be cynical, but as intellectual property, Tom and Jerry are pretty freaking important, even now, to David Zaslav, who probably wants to feed Tom to a shark. <laughs> one, one, one of the things I I, I, I point out that. in here. <laughs> One of the things I want to point out in here is that, and I do point, well, first of all, they won more Oscars than Meryl Streep. Sorry, but it's true. With all due respect. Oh, now we're getting into Hanna-Barbera and MGM and Hanna-Barbera's history. 
Yes. Okay. But, All right. but, it, but I do have some <laughs> of that in the book. But I also want to point out something about Tom and Jerry also about the recent stuff where the people are like, it's no good anymore. <laughs> the stuff that Spike Brandt does and that Tony uh, Sabone do, um, you know, they're not the old stuff, but take a look at some of that stuff. You know that the Back to Oz score, same songwriters that wrote Dear Evan Hansen, and wrote uh, some of the La La Land songs and this new Snow White that's coming out. It's like, it, it's it's not like they they it, it, it was it was a good score, and it, the the animation is not all outsourced. They still had Dale Bear working on the Wonka one, doing the the slug work thing. You know, people have this assumption that it's it's like bottom it's bottom drawer. No, they do they. They do as much as they can, as well as they can, and take a real good look at what they did, look at the circumstances around it, and how, when other people had the same circumstances, didn't quite cut it as well as they did, and why. Because it was a very L.A. thing where you had voice artists who were also DJs, right? I mean, Casey Kasem, of course, being the most famous. But it wasn't just Casey. There were a lot of people who worked in radio, worked in cartoons, Gary worked Owens. in music. Right. Hannah Barbera might have had limited animation, but its audio was off the scope. Adults or uh, working adults tend to be a little more dismissive of arts aimed toward kids. If you did not grow up with it, if it's not your nostalgia, uh, sometimes I feel that uh, people can get dismissive. And as an adult, uh, the quality of the writing, the animation, everything is uh, sometimes amazing. Uh, just because it's for kids doesn't mean it is easily dismissed or the quality of the work is less. Yeah, I totally agree. And we've talked about, you know, Peter Pan records and stuff that's aimed at kids. And it's kind of an art form unto itself. Just because something is made for kids doesn't mean that it, you know, doesn't have, it doesn't have the same musicians, the same singers, and the same attention to detail and quality when they're done well. And I, and when Sesame Street was on, I was way too old for it, but I, I still liked it. And I still bought the records because it's like, and, and I go back to it and I think, I can't believe how good this stuff is, the quality of these melodies and the and how sharp the, um, the Muppets humor was, how they taught these these things so well. You no matter how you approach them, whether they're supposed to be teaching you or just entertaining you, you can just admire them for what they are. Kelsey, your dad exposed you to a lot of things, plus you were watching TV. You know, when I first uh, told you we were going to be talking about Hanna-Barbera, what did Hanna-Barbera mean to you? Okay, well, so I didn't recognize the name, but obviously once I, once I looked into it, I went, well, I've seen all of this. I've seen Wacky Races. I've seen, uh, like, did they do all the Looney Tunes as well? Like, um, they didn't do Roadrunner and, and those. Did they do those? That, that was Warner Brothers. So okay, it, tell me, tell me the distinction here. Actually, can because I don't know if everybody will know it just off the top of their head. Can we name a lot of the cartoons that they did just Greg, for Greg? Do you want to? You want to take that? Yeah, yeah, and and you know you have every right to be confused because Warner Brothers bought them and they clustered them all together. Yeah, so it's exactly very hard. Yeah, and and then they put them on channels and it's yeah. Uh, it's uh, Huckleberry Hound, Yogi Bear, Quick Draw McGraw, The Flintstones, The Jetsons, um, Johnny Quest, Scooby-Doo, The Funky Phantom, Goober and the Ghost Chasers, Jabberjaw, uh, Laugh Olympics, um, Partridge Family 22,000 AD. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, there's just tons and tons of them. There's Top tons, Cat. yeah. I okay, mean, there so are the, thousands. <laughs> namely, the ones Smurfs. that I've definitely seen episodes of. Yeah, I've definitely seen episodes of the Smurfs in the morning on Cartoon Network. Definitely seen Yogi Bear, um, and then also one more Scooby Doo, obviously. Uh, so, like growing up, 
watching these cartoons, I also never, I, I appreciated them for what they were. And I never looked at like the animation quality, for instance, like, you know, as, as time goes on when I'm watching them, it's what the early two thousands. So there are better animated series out there, but not better in terms of the actual quality. Older TV, I have found, has more narrative structure, better episode, like episodic structure. I felt like they put more time, and I think you can definitely see that with the cartoons um, from Hanna Barbera. Gee, I'm so glad to hear you say that. <laughs> you know, Greg, I imagine you went a lot into how they changed the actual business itself. Well, yeah, and I'll while well, I go through the. The, the move from MGM, which started the studio, and then the fact that they really weren't an independent company for very long. That's part of why Hanna-Barbera is and was what it was. Bill and Joe were guys that worked for people and they ran a studio committed to staying open and making cartoons because that's what they loved to do. And after 10 years, they were bought by Taft Broadcasting. Taft wasn't a real bad company for them. And Taft started the theme parks and that's where the Brady's and the Partridge's went. But Hanna-Barbera was not Disney. They made cartoons and then live action and they were gonna grow and diversify, but it was about keeping that studio running. One of the things that Tom Cito told me was that there was about, I don't know, 15, 1,500 people working or 1,400 people working in like 1978. And there was about 175 working at mm. Disney. Uh, uh, Mark Evanier I did an interview and I, I'm using this as well, where he asked Bill Hanna, uh, this is an extraordinary thing. Maybe you should like turn down an assignment and maybe <laughs> you spend, spend more time on something. And he said, okay, Mark, look down that hallway and you tell me who to fire. Bill Bill was about, he reminds me of the crusty guy who gets off of the, the uh, either the railroad, the, the railroad car or the, um, the big chugging printing press and is wiping his greasy hands and saying, okay, what are we putting on next? But he would, but he'd throw himself on the tracks for any of his people. And Joe Barbera is the guy who's out there hustling you know, he walked out of one meeting, apparently, I don't know if it's apocryphal or not, walked out of one meeting, forgot what he sold. <laughs> <laughs> he, he was so good. So that's what they did. They complemented each other so yeah. well. And the picture behind you is a great example of what you were talking about. Those are the employees. It was some kind of employee day and they got everybody outside and took a picture you know, celebrating whatever, right? There was a lot of change in the 90s, you know, because it went from Taft was bought by Great America, or Ted Turner bought the library, and then Turner sold it to Warner. So in the space of a few years, um, they were owned by various companies. And the other thing to consider too is they were never completely autonomous. And because uh, you mentioned the sound effects and the sound effects library or something, if you have any exposure to Hanna-Barbera, right? And this would be different than a Looney Tunes cartoon that the Hanna-Barbera sounds were kind of a syntax, I guess. Like you knew that the Fred Flintstone feet, like ta -ta 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 -ta, you knew what that was. That doesn't sound like people running quickly in real life. Kelsey, did you ever have any like Scooby-Doo toys or anything? Was it a Oh yeah. Um, Scooby-Doo, Scooby-Doo was a big one. I think we bought even like the Hot Wheels Scooby-Doo set. Um, that was, that was a whole <laughs> thing. That's great. So, and like growing up, we used to have, I don't, I don't, I think we had Flintstones mugs. Did McDonald's do a run of, of mugs themed after like cartoons? That was, was it McDonald's? My dad used to collect those. So Did like, right. I would, I would have mugs and, and whatnot um, from all of these cartoons. My entire childhood. Uh, my dad owns a comic book store, by the way. I say it in pretty much every episode <laughs> to every new guest. So uh, yeah, growing up, I was watching all sorts of weird stuff that he would just put on for us, including 
uh, all of these old cartoons that it was, you know, growing up, he would vet it for quality, right? And whatever he loved growing up, that's what we would see. What I want to jump into in terms of the book and, and talking about the book, I want to know what sources then you interacted with to get all of this information. And then I guess like a little tease for, for why I should read it. Maybe one of like your favorite uh, facts you learned in the process. Um, I, have a, I have a feature on Jerry Beck's cartoon research um, blog called Animation Spin. I, haven't, I didn't review that many of the records because there's well over 200. So the question began, how do you organize them? Uh, do we do this chronologically? How do you weave them? The, the, big, the big dilemma became, how do you keep people from saying, why are there records in this? Who mm. cares? Because many of the people I contacted had never listened to these records. Mm. Most of the, uh, the people who made them are gone. Uh, the artists who did the covers, a few of those are here, but they didn't listen to them. That's why some of the covers don't match. That's why Snagglepuss yeah. is, is like the cowardly lion on the cover of The Wizard of Oz, but he's not playing it on the record. They didn't hear the records. Right. They just gave, they, here's the title, do a cover. I contacted uh, Dr. Demento. He said, I have to admit, I don't know the Hanna-Barbera stuff. And I'm like, you know everything. You're omnipotent. And no, he didn't know. And so I found a few people who did have some comments and very good ones about specific. Tim Hollis had some about the golden records and I use those, but mostly it came from uh, to everything I have been watching and listening to as many episodes. I mean, 425 Smurfs twice. Uh -huh. oh that's a, <laughs> that's <challenge>. a lot <laughs> it's not and and it's not to me it's not torture some people no. are saying i'm so sorry and i'm like no i think it's a great uh, show and i think it's very rich in uh in, in really terrific scoring and and an all-star cast of great actors you know mm -hmm. um i always like the smurfs i appreciate it more now than then because that launched a genre that Disney did after Hanna-Barbera because the Smurfs opened the door for storybook, gentle storybook fairy tale, uh, little characters on Saturday morning, which was revolutionary then. Uh, I mean, it changed TV and um, that cartoon on television established them worldwide and made them as made them a phenomenon is that that it's very interesting because you're telling the story of Hanna Barbera through the lens of their records and music releases it's a little windier because uh it wasn't their primary business but no. it was a big business and they sold records Right? And, I mean, and it was a, yeah, and it was like Disney, it was a much more significant part of their business than anyone would have imagined. And it had an impact on the entertainment business more than anyone would have imagined, especially their own label. And the rock and roll that was on the Flintstones, Danny Hutton appeared on the Flintstones, on the Pebbles and Bam Bam episode on the screen. You know, so, and so did one of the singles that they were trying to promote, Dance in the Sand. Uh, was their very first release single. So, so then there's this whole business that actually Cliff Nesteroff, uh, who writes a lot mm -hmm. about pop culture, yeah. I used he is his two essays because he had written a lot about the pop stuff. And that's a whole other extraordinarily bizarre story where they were getting in, they made about 75 pop singles. You know, the Avengers theme, Laurie Johnson's Avengers theme, the first mm -hmm. time it appeared in America See, it was on Pie Records in, in England, but the first time it was imported to America was on the Hanna-Barbera label. Oh, that was, yeah, on a single and on an album. So that kind of stuff, you know, they were, it was part of their company. I had a meeting once at Adult Swim. They, they told me that uh, quite a few of their programs didn't really make that much money on the air, but their recordings were making money. They're touring. I love them. And, uh, you know, live shows that that model still works with animation. Oh, yeah. Yeah. He had, they had the musical barbecue and the surf and turf. And and there's also a, a promo album with about 90 uh, drop ins that 
that the space ghost did for radio stations, you know, thoughts for the day oh, and stuff. And, funny. uh, and then the Brack album from the Brack uh, special for the direct mm-hmm. video, uh, which is ghost. And, uh, my, my favorite alien invaders is a great album. Yeah. Like yeah we actually Eater. used to listen to those in the car. Like oh, my dad's. It's, it's, it's a great one. <laughs> Driving Get music. Those. Oh, the, and then the romantic one where Sh- Shaggy sings about the moon. I mean, that's hysterical. Mm-hmm. It's a great mm-hmm. album, you know. So Ryan, and then when Rhino started in the '90s, and Earl mm-hmm. Cress, who who the, who was really sort of a part of the the soul of this book too, because he he re he reinstituted the the recordings in the '90s. He he unearthed the the all, a lot of these soundtrack uh, themes and background scores. And Rhino was very receptive to that. So they put out the picnic basket set with all the discs in it and all of this great background music came out. Um, so it was, oh, it was gold. If, if, if interest was developed from this project, that vinyl aimed at adults, vinyl re, because this stuff is, the stuff yeah. from the 60s is not, not for children anymore because the jokes are about LBJ and the atomic bomb and you still know, important some of them could be reissued um on vinyl in maybe a set or something and the art is gorgeous and now there is the way of reproducing the art matt and i have one friend at water tower music and still still there and he's still there and <laughs> we are we we're more than happy Serious to put you in question. touch with him yeah uh, I don't know if he can help, but he's he's a good guy, and he certainly is a fan. So. They they have done uh, some very interesting stuff, you know. And uh, Dan and I were more than happy to take complimentary copies of what they did. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the Wizard of Oz was gorgeous, and the uh, the Grinch was very nice, you know. The no, and Grinch. and you know our our old boss George worked very closely. Because George is totally, as you know, oh, a yes. music score guy, and and he knows it inside and out. And he was he was always working hand in hand with those guys because you know the actual scores, the actual tracks, all that stuff lives in a vault in his mind and is <laughs> yeah. scattered across a giant corporate library. So it's really his mind is the index. Because uh, I believe it was like 1990 when the Carl Stalling Project uh, CD came yes. out. That that sounds yeah. about right. Yeah, it was 1991. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that, to me, because uh, Kelsey, that's the you know uh, the music of Looney Tunes, and it's so distinctive. But they did a great job of marketing that. You know, I was in college yeah. radio at the time, and we would play that, and it had never been. Uh, presented to me separately from right no uh, i mean it was it was before it was it was it was really it was really genius and it was like this obvious thing that had been sitting in front of everyone and no one had done it and as soon as it was done everyone went oh wait a minute and then you realize oh they just hadn't done it with carl stalling there's this other legacy that you've been ignoring yeah yeah Yeah. And it was and it was very adult. It was yeah. not a children's it, it, thing. It was not for kids, wow. and I had never encountered anything like it. And, but that was one that wound up on like the playlist, and and it came with um, a little booklet like inside. It was so good, and I had always uh, collected sound effect records because oh, yeah. yeah, me too. Yeah, they, yeah, they were weird, and yeah. uh, the great thing about working at the college radio station is we we had a studio where I could put actually two records on at once, uh, hit record and talk over them. Yeah, it was like I, I'd never worked with such uh, and it was it was professional equipment. Yeah, but it two was track. So much fun. Yeah, I could have music <laughs> and sound effects. As Dan knows, as digital video came in and they started, I think they released like the Hanna Barbera sound effect collection oh yeah 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 yeah. it's still a a sought after i think a collectible cd but you know it was hundreds and and hundreds of sounds there's a whole other podcast we can just do about hanna-barbera's keyboard sound clip device 
that oh, they used the in the six, yes that they used in the 60s and the 70s that that I don't think people are aware of the keyboard sound clip thing that existed in television particularly Hanna Barbera's but it's also laugh tracks and everything else it, but it, it, oh. mm-hmm. was it yeah. like a Charlie, Charlie Douglas yeah yeah was it like a cart machine? It played like tape loops, like what? Yeah, yeah. It was, it was, it was tape loops it triggered like by hit... keystrokes. Yeah, yeah. You know, ha- Howard Stern had like an and, early and, version yeah, of that. Yeah, and, and Hanna Barbera had a bank of oh, like wow. Yeah, and, and that's so what they would, they would be, use. They and would play that live. They, yeah, yeah. That's My dad cool. must have had one of these one of these CDs because I remember he worked for a radio station uh, oh. for a little bit. And he would clip those things. He would make our own CDs. We he would burn them for us. Yeah. And he would. I remember distinctly Yogi Bear opening songs. Oh. Like he he would just put some Yogi Bear clips in front of in front of each next track. Yeah. So ah. see, that's the sound of love. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> You no, know, it it, it makes me yeah. very fond for, yeah. for those That's characters awesome. as well. Really interested in the generational aspect of the Hanna Barbera legacy. When people think of Looney Tunes, there's a very specific thing that is really locked in their heads, and it doesn't it doesn't include most of the '60s Looney Tunes output. Hanna Barbera, on the other hand, of the MGM era. Is like high quality gloss animation, right? And oh, then yeah. you, and then you have the Hanna Barbera of the fifties, which is sort of like developmental, like we're switching this up for TV. And then you have the explosion of the sixties with both the prime time and the Saturday morning. And I still remember everyone talks about the the and Greg will know. When the Flintstones was referred to as a pen and ink disaster. Yeah, I think I'm pretty sure it was Variety. It may have been yeah. Hollywood Reporter, but I think it was Variety. Barbara then, never never got over that. Yeah, Ooh. and then in like in retrospect, I don't know, like like when when Matt and I saw the initial masters for the scans of the Jetsons, it was it was just like this is this was not a disaster at all. The, oh, for God's even sake. the limited animation stuff, especially stuff they did for prime time, but even even the Saturday morning stuff. Yeah, Johnny Quest and the Jetsons looked fantastic, but you know what looked really good? Herculoids. Really? Oh good. yeah. Oh, yeah. you know what? I I I was blown away by the Blu-ray of that. Yeah. And, and what what you also get with the Blu-rays is you are you are. Oh, blown away by you've got, you know, no matter what, no matter what, how fluid the animation is or not, you've got color stylists who know color and know how and background artists who are our artists and just stand there and just look, just stare at the screen. And and when it's on Blu-ray, it is dazzling to, to look at. It's beautiful. They, yeah, it is beautiful. And then and then the eighties, there's sort of this resurgence, as we know, like the the superstar movies and their syndication stuff. And then, and then Cartoon Network in the nineties is a whole new era. And like Hanna Barbera as a production facility reinvents itself only to then be uh, kneecapped. Hanna Barbera as a brand, because of the legacy of the work of the people who worked on it, is probably strongest animation brand names still to the point where you know there's initiative going on in the uk and they're they're openly trying to exploit it i don't know how successful it is this is me being old fan so ignore that but i'm just saying it is it is fascinating when people think animation i think you think disney and i think you think hannah barbera talking to kelsey earlier she did not have that distinction because she fell in that post, you know, the Cartoon Network where they kind of blended it all together. And off the top mm-hmm. of her head, it's like there's the Turner, you know, because Dan and I see it as, well, there's the Turner Cartoon Network output. There's the, you know, legacy 
Looney Tunes output, the Hanna-Barbera output, and then the WB animation output. Like we see it as kind of four uh, competing sort of uh, styles and, uh, and how they blend. And Dan and I, especially, you know, going from at least the early 90s on, you can see the people uh, generally would work together in sort of one of those uh, tracks. And fans learned to sort of follow those tracks, like the Tim verse, you know, like Bruce Tim's vision of Batman and Batman the animated series is, is pretty yeah. uh, easy to track uh, and its influence. Um, you know, uh, classic uh, Looney Tunes, you know, it was reinvented in the 90s a little bit with the Animaniacs, which, you know, are being brought back, right? Like, Kelsey, you you know what the Animaniacs are? That that might have fallen into your... I don't, I don't remember hole. if I've seen Animaniacs. Yeah, that's okay. The, Pinky and the Brain? I've seen Pinky and the Brain. So it's like, when were you young and what were you exposed to and how much yeah. further did you go into the weeds you know like yeah that. It, well I definitely didn't go into the weeds because when I was watching this I probably could barely read I, right. I, I yeah I was I was shown these when I was really young I'm and I'm thinking like Scooby-Doo is really interesting because it does the animation does also change over time um and the different reboots and like what's also interesting is the theme song I, listening to the different versions of the theme song mm -hmm. the like first one is way slower than than yeah. the newer versions um and the animation style is also really interesting um so i i see what you're saying in terms of like reboots and keeping these characters alive i think with scooby-doo they managed to do it really well um some of the other characters not as well you know the, the johnny quest uh tom and jerry crossover is a an interesting example of of uh how how you can successfully take two historic yeah. brand you know brands but, and but honestly audience. this is how fans who are animators behind the scenes are able to sneak one through because yeah. they were able to justify it because it was Tom and Jerry. Tom and, and Jerry. I haven't seen Spike. Yes, West. it is. You should see it. It's it's it's, it is true. Done. It's true to Johnny and it's true to Tom and Jerry and it's it it's really good. And yeah, and and, and style wise, they just got. I mean, it's it's astonishing. The art artistically, they worked really hard on matching the styles and then making them fit together. One of the things I noticed about, because I looked at all the Tom and Jerry's and then the, the 92 movie. Um, and here's a little factoid that um, a lot of people were surprised by, but I lived through it. Because when I was working at Disney, um, the movie had come out and Disney was just about to buy Miramax. Hmm. And so Disney had, and I have a photograph of them, Disney had Tom and Jerry at their park at the what was the disney right, the MGM, mgm studios in florida and disney made a commercial promoting tom and jerry at their park and they showed the costume characters running around not universal but running around the disney mgm studios chasing each other i mean that is and plus i always love to bring guests through and say come over here to the plaque with william hannah and joseph barbera's names on it here at this disney park because they're part of the uh, Academy uh, honorees. But what was interesting was the, that movie had its problems, but they solved them because the reason those Tom and Jerry films work for those who say, why in the world would it work when you put them with this character or when you, when you stick them on this book or add them to this story? Because they're like the second couple in a Broadway musical, you know, like Gower Champion and, uh, you know, they're the, the, the second couple or they're like Abbott and Costello. They're the, the, the drama's going on and they're us or they're, they're the conduit between us. And once they discovered Tom and Jerry would work that way, they could put them in anything. Right. And, and for some bizarre reason, those things work. They shouldn't, but they do. <laughs> I think they. <laughs> that's like the magic of the comedy duo, right? You know, Abbott Costello can go anywhere. Yeah. 
or not yeah. to Mars. Um, well, wow. <laughs> when should uh, people look for this book? We're looking at either Christmas 2023 or spring 24. And I'm very lucky, I got to say, and it's really Tim Hollis who brought me into that fold that I got a publisher like this because um, I want this to be a book everybody blesses and says that, you know, this is because we have so much out there that isn't quite, I don't want it to be wrong. You know, I don't, and, and, right. and it's very hard to make sure that, that when you make a declaration that this is the first one, it's like, it better be the first one right. when you, when you say things like that. So. Do you already have the photos that are going to go in the book? I don't think it'll just be text. So visually, oh, how, how does that process look? We negotiated how many photos we were allowed to use. And then it's also a matter of digging out personal photos, contacting people saying, can we use this? Can we use that? Um, getting photos of, of, you know, like Herb Duncan, who was the, the, the golden George Jetson and stuff like that. And then f uh, photographing album covers. Uh, I don't know. I don't know that I'm going to photograph all of them because I don't know how many uh, will be allowed to use. These colors, these album covers, especially the ones they did themselves, you know, because it was an in-house record company. Those co those were hand painted uh, mm -hmm. covers with with hand painted lettering, and they were gorgeous. Um, and if we could actually get the source art, that would be even better. But but they can still make them look really nice. Uh, I think fair use comes into play too. Um, the, the depending on what legal says. We're speaking about this album. We want to show the cover. Is that fair use? It depends on what their legal says. We don't have that many pages either. Do you guys remember the blue, the beautiful blue label that HBR had with the, with the sound waves? Oh, yeah. oh, I'd love to have that somehow. In fact, Water Tower released one reissue from the original albums, Puppels and Bam Bam Christmas. And mm. they, they had, they had a whole thing in the J in the J card uh, uh, mm. of the blue HBR mm -hmm. with the, with those squiggly waves. It's a gorgeous yeah, yeah. label. And I'd love to be able to incorporate that in. But the magic know. of rights and clearances, which is, you yeah. know, I've done a book and that takes uh, almost as much time as it does to write it. Which uh, means, mm -hmm. you know, that's why I'm, that's why I don't want to yeah. promise it too soon. Yeah. Yeah. Know, because... No, that's a, yeah. that's a good point. Dan, do you have any uh, final questions? About music clearances? No, just uh, cause we got to wrap it up. That was me cueing you to be like, do you have anything else? Cause we have uh, a question from our listeners. Before we get to listener questions, I'm going to do a personal plug. After after the article on the Slinky, on page <laughs> Ju 49, Juliana? there is an article on search. Uh, if you read this article, you might see my name. That is... Oh, Dan, what is search? Why don't you tell people? Search is the greatest spy-fi show you've never watched. It was a wheel show in which agents used high-tech devices to be in touch with a mission control operation that helped them with their spy missions. It starred Hugh O'Brien, Tony Franciosa, Doug McClure, and most importantly, Burgess Meredith, who played the head of mission control. Uh, it I, lasted less than one season, and I love it very much. It, I, I thought of it as like the early 70s version of 24. Howard Gordon has honestly talked about okay, good. how much search was an influence on 24. It, yeah. It's like inside out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's inside out plus 24. 24. That's cool. Wasn't that Le wasn't that a Leslie Stevens show? It was. It was Leslie Stevens, yeah. From the Outer Limits. Hot off of Outer Limits teamed up with Bob Justman. Hot off of season three of Star Trek. By the way, Kelsey, don't feel bad if you haven't heard of it because that is quite an obscurity. Search? But, yeah. Yeah. 1973. Is that correct? Dan? 73. Yeah. I don't think they clipped it in American TV I, history. I had, I had never seen it. And Dan, Dan could not stop talking about it. And the day that uh, word came that search, search would be unearthed, uh, 
Dan said it was huge news on his Yahoo list server, which in the 2010s, he was still part of. <laughs> like, that's how long fans were yeah, that Yeah, that Yahoo group comes up in the article, <laughs> so everyone should read it. All right, well, speaking of groups, I, uh, I informed our masses of social media followers that uh, we would be talking about Hanna-Barbera and its legacy. And uh, I got uh, a few questions. This comes from Sarah from Twitter. Are Barbera properties in Pasadena owned by the same people behind the animation? Someone tell me about Barbera properties in Pasadena because I don't know what that is. I don't either. Well, let me tell you. two of us, okay. They are a, a rental company of apartments based in the San Gabriel Valley that was for, founded in 1956. So uh, they rent apartments? It's, it's like, an, uh, you know, you go to their Barbera Properties uh, website and, you know, they own right. and rent properties and they do it in uh, the San Gabriel Valley. I think they have some apartments uh, in so, Phoenix. It's a so real estate thing. It's somebody's side business. So, wait, did we find it, out that the answer is yes or no? Ah, good question. Because I was like, 56? It it sounds like a Joe Barbera relative. Right. But but uh, I couldn't make that. They did not reference it on their website. So, But I, I, I was like, at first I was like, that's a ridiculous question. And then I was like, well, maybe. I thought wow, it was like yeah. a snarky comment. And then I was like, huh. And then I, of course, did find a Cartoon Brew article from uh, 2011. Uh, God bless Cartoon Brew. <laughs> that um, they, they uh, uh, reported that uh, Joe Barbero's wi- uh, widow sold their Studio City estate uh, uh, in um for seven million dollars uh at studio city is not quite in the san gabriel valley uh but then they made a comment that was quote it's not the real site of any real animation history unless you're an admirer of a pup named scooby-doo in jetson's the movie and who isn't uh there was we love you (laughs) tiffany as judy There was a comment that, uh, from a fan of 1991's Yo Yogi who countered that the house should actually be uh, the Yo Yogi house. Yeah, the Yo Yogi <laughs> house and deserved a plaque. Uh, They're right. They're that right. was it. That was uh-huh. it for questions, and we answered it because we. I said we'd answer any question. Dan, uh, we do accept review copies. And specifically, they they are to be addressed to you. Is that is that true? Still, has anybody ever sent you anything? Not not yet. Oh, there you go. As I've made clear, help you engage with your fan base. Yes. So uh, you can contact Dan on Twitter at uh, at Dwiff. D W I F F, right? not to be confused with the Detroit yeah. Windsor International Film send, Festival. Slide into Dan's DMs and uh, yeah. send, send him review copies. Look, like life, Cthulhu ends with death or madness. And so does this podcast. There we go. I'm Matt hey. Patterson. This, these are my uh, co hosts Kelsey Milbain. Yeah, yeah, Kasagawa. And our okay. special guest, Greg Airbar. Airbar. Greg Airbar. Thanks for yeah, everybody you. for uh, bearing with us. And I hope you learned something today about Hanna Barbera and their musical legacy. Woo. Bye. Bye.